Hi, thanks for joining us for the Family Plot, Gardening in the Mid-South. I'm Chris Cooper. When you think of summer flowers, you usually think of annuals. Today, we're gonna to talk about some woody perennials with summer color. Also, we'll be canning fresh peaches. That's just ahead on the Family Plot, Gardening in the Mid-South. Production funding for the Family Plot, Gardening in the Mid-South is provided by the WKNO Production Fund, the WKNO Endowment Fund, and by viewers like you. Thank you. Welcome to the Family Plot. I'm Chris Cooper. Joining me today is Celeste Scott. Celeste is a UT Extension agent in Madison County, and Ms. Juanita Jones will be joining me later. Hi, right, Celeste. Hey. We're going to talk about woody perennials with summer interest. Yes, sir. We've got plenty to talk about. Yes, yeah, so let's talk about those because I'm very interested in this. Good. Yes. Well, so just starting off, I feel like spring flowering shrubs always steal the show, yes, right? That's what so many mm -hmm. people focus on. Uh, that's the, the beginning of our growing seasons, right? Things are starting to pop, colors are coming out. And then I feel like once we get into summertime, sometimes <laughs> we kind of, you know, we get a little uh, tired, a little lax in yes. our, our planning. And I just want to make sure that folks know that there are plenty of uh, perennial woody type plants yes. that will come back year after year yes. that will provide some color to our, our summer landscape. Now that'll be good because again, when we think of summer, we think about the heat, right? Yes. Think about how hot it is. And, and having to water. Yeah, so, you know, water. so right. often we right. associate annuals, you know, annual color with providing that pop of color That's in right. the summertime, but they require so much water. Right. And once you get a, per, uh, a perennial or, you know, woody, woody type plant established, they do not quite require quite as much yeah. attention. Oh, that sounds good to me. Yeah. All right, so let's get with the first one. Okay, let's so the it. first one that I want to talk about today um, is abelia. And okay. we're kind of starting like on the, the small scale, right? Okay. And then we're going to work our way up to larger plants. So abelia can be so versatile. You know, there are some older um, cultivars. Canyon Creek is one that many people are probably familiar mm -hmm. with that really has a, a beautiful, we'll call it a semi-evergreen foliage. Okay. So it's not going to hold that foliage um, potentially depending on where you are, you know, in the United States all, all season long. Um, but also has a really beautiful bloom mm -hmm. right in the summertime. Mm -hmm. We're talking kind of late summertime. So it's starting to set blooms about midsummer, and then we're talking full bloom by, okay. by late summer. And abelias are also nice because they can be grown in a, a wider range of zones. So we're looking at five Good. to nine. Good. And Good. then if you are, you need even more variation, <laughs> they've got newer cultivars out that are more compact. So we're looking at things like Rose Creek um, would be an example. Edward Goucher is a really nice compact cultivar that you might want to right. use in a landscape type situation. Um, and then one of my favorites is what we call glossy abelia, mm -hmm. and it has mm -hmm. a darker, shiny mm -hmm. leaf. It is actually considered more evergreen than our the other semi-evergreen cultivars, and it has huge blooms on it that are fragrant. Nice. And so that is one of my favorites. It's not a compact version, but okay. lots of lots of options with abelia. Okay. Um, the next one I kind of wanted to highlight is um, the butterfly bush. Butterfly bush. So right. Budlia, yeah, many of you might be familiar with that. <laughs> and I, I really love butterfly bush, but sometimes, again, depending on what zone we're in, it can be a struggle. And so this mm. is where cultivar selection is going to be really important. So overall, Budlias can be grown successfully in zones five through nine, but some require specifically like zone seven or above. So we just have to be really careful when we're picking those um, cultivars okay. that we're um, researching uh, the zones that they're appropriate for and making sure that we're picking uh, ones that are going to do well in our areas. And why some of those require at least a zone seven is because if we get a hard winter, sometimes even in zone seven, we can have some dieback of that oh, above gosh. ground portion of the plant, okay. but the roots aren't killed. Gotcha. So, you know, you may see some twigginess from year to year. Uh, we have lots of great cultivars, you know, of course, some of our, our older tried and trues, you know, we would call them would be Black Knight that has the really big, dark purple, um, panicle type blooms. Uh, Purple Prince and Royal Red have both been mm -hmm. around quite a while. It gives you some variation okay. in color bloom options, but they've been coming out with newer hybrids, again, that are more compact. Right, That's the key you. word we're going to see. Everyone right. wants a compact plant <laughs> right. in the landscape. So we've got uh, lots more to choose out there. Blue Chip, um, Miss Ruby, 
Those are real cool names. Yeah, aren't those? Those yeah. are cute. Mm -hmm. And so, and there's a whole bunch more, but those are oh, just two, two that come to mind. Okay. And then this is kind of a neat thing that I wanted to throw in there. There is a, another hybrid. It's called Orange Scepter, but it is not compact. They have bred this one particularly for its unique color. It has orange blooms. How about that? And there are over a foot long okay. panicle blooms, so that's wow. kind of a unique thing to look for there. Nice. So oh. some really cool things okay. going on uh, with butterfly bushes. Good deal. Good deal. Um, now we're moving up kind of a step in size okay. as far as stature of the plants. And I, of course, we have to highlight Hydrangea you paniculata. Right. We can't have a discussion <laughs> on woody plants without uh, talking about a, a hydrangea of some sort. They are many of our first loves mm -hmm. um, when it comes to blooming shrubs. And I'm going to say that this one has the most versatile growth range. So okay. we're looking at zones 3 to 9, wow. USDA three? zones 3 to 9. Yeah. Okay. So this covers practically the entire United States except for some of those subtropic and tropic mm -hmm. areas. They are, you know, beautiful. Again, they're starting their blooms in uh, summer. Many of those, um, we're talking like around, you know, July or so are starting right. their blooms. Um, one of my personal favorites is called Phantom. Phantom. And the mm -hmm. bloom on this can be, I mean, bigger than a, my head, oh, wow. <laughs> uh, like as large as a, a, a basketball in some situations. And they can get so large that occasionally they might need a little extra support. Okay. But if we don't do a lot of pruning and we leave some of that woody structure to kind okay. of strengthen from year to year, that can help hold up those heavier bloom heads. Um, but, you know, there are many others to choose from. Limelight's been around yes, forever. Limelight. Well, I gotta yes. have limelight. Yes, gotta have that. Um, Vanilla strawberry is something kind of like new on the market, and I've added it to my garden, and it's okay. doing well. And But I will mention, if you see any of these uh, panicle-type hydrangeas that are marketed for color change okay. in the pink and red zones, you're going to have better color change in our northern uh, USDA zones than you do in the more humid areas. Gotcha. Okay. So here in zone uh, 7, where I live, I don't get a lot of pink coloration on those blooms. Okay. So yeah. just keep okay. that in mind. All right. And then again, compact options, little lime, which <laughs> still in itself doesn't really get that little. It's still like a five foot, you know, shrub. But if we want to get even on further down from there, we're looking at like Bobo or Baby <laughs> Lace. Those are excellent okay. options nice. for compact paniculatas. Um, so now we'll kind of move on. We'll talk about Rose of Sharon or ah. Hibiscus Syriacus. Yes, reminds yes. me of my grandmother. She oh, yes. Full of those. I know. Rose of Sharon. They yes. are a wonderful pass along plant. Mm -hmm. I mean, they're hardy. I feel like you can't kill them. Uh, <laughs> and they want to live. Yes. And they want to procreate. <laughs> 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 so if you have one, you might end up having some uh, babies popping up around them, either from reseeding or suckering from the roots. Suckering would be mine yeah. at home. Yes, yes. But the good thing is through some of these uh, newer uh, cultivars, they have bred for sterility. So you may occasionally see some suckers pop up, but you're not going to have as much uh, reseeding, you know, no. popping up all around the area. Good. That's really nice. And it has a really graceful kind of vase form. Mm -hmm. You know, a lot of folks mm -hmm. are like, well, I just don't know what to do with it because it's got such a strange form. I like it. I like it too. I, like it. I mean, there are all types of situations where you need something that's narrow down at the base, but to fill a larger space yeah, up top. Kind of gets up and over. Yeah, yes. I, I like it. And covered in blooms, so many different yes. color options. Um, anything from lavender to dark pink, hot pink. There's even like some whites that have dark pink or red mm -hmm. centers. Mm -hmm. uh, one of my personal favorites is called blue chiffon. Blue chiffon. Yes. And it in certain light literally looks blue and it's very rare to find a plant that has a, a blue bloom on it. So, so lots of lots of options. God, that was a good list, Celeste. Oh, thanks. Good stuff. We could tell you really like those. Oh, I do. <laughs> those woody perennials. And we could talk about it for more, but I think maybe we need to stop there. I think that's really good. <laughs> well, thank you, Celeste. Real good information. Appreciate You're that. You're welcome. All right. Japanese beetles are here, and here's their damage. And as you can see here, they pretty much chewed this canna leaf in this area right here. They attack over 300 species of plants. They have chewing mouth parts. Again, they're big eaters. So how do you control Japanese beetles? There's a couple of things you can do here. One, I would get a bucket of warm soapy water and just knock them in. 
or I would use something like horticultural oil or neem oil. Now, there are some other products that you can use, but those products are what I consider to be heavy pesticides like bifenthrin. So if you want to protect those pollinators that are out there, I would use the oils or just get you a bucket of warm soapy water and just knock them in. Hi, Miss Juanita. We have some beautiful, tasty peaches here. Yes, we do. What are do. you about to do with those? I'm about to can these peaches up for use later on when we get done with the season. Uh, the season is usually over, oh, about the 1st of September, okay. middle of September, long in there. So these can be enjoyed year round and you get your local product all year from the canning. From the canning. Yes. All right, sounds good. Okay. All right. All right, so you want to demonstrate? Yes. Uh, we cut those peaches, <laughs> okay. those gut peaches from Jones right. Orchard. Uh, the, the first thing we do, Chris, is to get our, get our jars and make sure the jars are nice and clean and sterilized. Okay. Now, I have uh, taken the liberty to go ahead and fill these, and I wanted to show you what I do with the peaches and how I cut them and, and all of that. Is that okay? That's just fine. Okay. That works for me. Now, these peaches have been washed, and we want to start out with, of course, clean fruit, uh, everything has to be very clean so that you don't get any spoilage or anything out of the uh, out of the ordinary in your fruit and it, it uh, 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 that's one thing that you want to be very careful about okay, okay now I've peeled this one so uh, this jar I've done quarters and this jar I've done halves and I just want you to see the difference and in, into for the quarters I just cut them like that mm -hmm. and put them in the jar and then when I do the halves I turn these upside down and put them down one on, on top of the other. Okay. And you've probably done this a million I've done times. It, I've done it a few times. Uh, a few times. <laughs> yeah. You're good at it. I can see that. <laughs> okay uh, then after after we do that we um, put some uh, what this is called a simple syrup <laughs> and the way we do the simple syrup, uh, I've done a medium syrup here, and I use four cups of water and three cups of sugar, mm. and I put it on the stove and let it come to a boil. Okay. You don't want to, to put it in when it's grainy or anything like that with the sugar. And, and so you fill, fill this, and you want to make sure that you have the syrup over the top of your product. Uh, that way you don't get the air uh, the air will cause discoloration. It won't affect the nutritive value or anything. It just uh, is the aesthetics of it. Okay. So you want to make sure that it's uh, that you're uh, it's over the top. Now, why, why do we put the syrup over the peaches anyway? To give it flavor mm -hmm. and to to. Uh, I don't know how you could can peaches without, <laughs> without putting, it's just, it's just a plain peach in there. I don't think it would give it enough liquid to okay. to to keep it from turning dark. Right. Just in case it, somebody asks us. Oh, okay. okay. Well, we won't answer questions. That's right. So after you get the air bubbles out, you want to make sure you get as much of the air bubbles out that you possibly can. Uh, then, then your syrup sometimes will look diminished. So if that happens, you will need to add some more to make sure that you have plenty of syrup. And one of the most important things uh -huh. that you'll ever do in canning, and this is across the board, any comb canning or any kind of canning that you do, you want to make sure that these rims are clean, no product, nothing on there of any description so that it interferes with the sealing process. Mm -hmm. Now the sealing process comes from this rubberized around here. Okay. Okay, so what we want to do is to make sure that this seal is all intact on top of the jar. And this kind of curls down a little bit so that you get a good tight seal. So we put this on here and then we put, a, uh, put the band on. Not too tight, right? Not too tight. Okay. You just do it kind of where you can feel some resistance. Okay. And uh, then after that's done, it's ready to go in the water bath. Now, in case we have somebody, Chris, who, <laughs> and you might not know yourself what a water bath is. Okay. okay. Water bath, you just get a, a, big, a big pot and you put enough water in so that when you put your jars in, your, your product in, you make sure that it comes 
an inch or two over the top. Over the top. Now the you top. want to make sure that it's over the top and not halfway up or anything else because you want to make sure you get plenty of heat to, uh, to get the uh, sealing process okay. all the way in. So then we will, we'll do that. We'll put these in the, in the, in the canner. Here we go. This goes in the water bath. And you will notice that the water, the water will not be up very far when you first start. But once you get the jars in, it brings the water up so that it'll come over the top. Now, if you put too much water in to begin with, and you put these jars in, what's going to happen? It's going to come out the top. Right. It's going to overflow for you. So we put this in here, and what we do, Chris, we, we put, we, we let it come to a boil. Okay. Let, it, uh, let it come to a good boil, and then we turn it down just to simmer, and we, uh, we cook it. After it starts to boil, you start your timer for uh, 25 minutes. Okay. 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 So we're ready to look at it and see if it's, see when it's gonna boil. We're gonna turn it up and it comes to a boil. Special delivery. <laughs> okay. So you are our big He-Man mm -hmm. today. Let's put it on this, on okay, this one on because this, one. this is more padding on that. Okay. Uh, Chris, thank you for doing that for me. Oh, no problem. Um, the, um, this doesn't have to come off the, uh, the stove right now, but since we need it over here for you people to look at, <laughs> <laughs> I, I got Chris to put it over here for me. So we're going to lift right. this up okay. and like this. And you will notice this is something very important that I want, uh, want you to understand. Um, is the sealing part of this. When you first take it up, you're going to have, see the, how the top is puffed up like this? Yes, ma'am. That, that is not sealed yet. And once it cools down and it creates a vacuum in there, it will, it will uh, make a seal. So here we go. That's what they look like wow. when you first take them out. Now, if you'll notice, this, this liquid is a, a little bit more clear than this one right here. It's a different variety of peach. And also, this will, this will be a little more like that once it, uh, once it sits for a while. Uh, one thing uh, that I wanted to mention also about the sealing on home canned food, it's very important that when you open a jar of something, uh, any kind of, any kind of, well, commercially canned either, if the top is puffed up or if you have any bubbles or if you have any discoloration, uh, I'm not talking about around the air bubbles, okay. but discoloration of the total product or something like that, throw it away. Oh, do do yeah. not use it. Uh, botulism, especially oh, okay. on uh, like green beans or something that's not acidified, when you get away from the acidified foods, the botulism is, is more prevalent. And I don't want to frighten anybody hmm. about home canned foods, but that is something that you need to be aware of. And I've eaten home canned foods all my life. And if you want to say I'm 80 years old, that's fine too. <laughs> <laughs> and I'll I've, let you say that. I've never I've never been I've never been sick off of it. But I would suggest that also if if you have something like that's not acidified and you have the discoloration and you have the tops popped up like that, throw the whole thing away, jar and all. Yeah, because we don't want anybody to get no, sick. No, we don't want anybody to get sick. And the home canned foods are perfectly safe if you follow the simple guidelines. And what, you, what you've seen today has been a very, very simple process and it's very safe. This has been an acidified food. And like I said on the front end, that's the reason we did not pressure these. When, when you have fruit and you, don't, and you have the acid already, then botulism doesn't grow in that. So uh, the reason you, you uh, do the pressure is to bring the temperature up enough so that it kills any of the spores or anything in that. So this is perfectly safe to do it like this. Ms. Juanita, we appreciate that demonstration. Oh, thank you much. my pleasure. Okay.
harvesting seed heads from plants in the carrot family that include dill, coriander, parsley, um, cilantro, these are some things that we want to think about. So we don't want to harvest the seed heads too early. This one here, you can see how green these seed heads are. That means they've just begun to develop. Then they come into like a, almost a yellow stage where they are really, uh, you can see the seed heads are really starting to, starting to develop and fatten up. And then once they turn this more brown color, and you can actually see some, some small stripes on those individual seeds, that is the ideal time for harvest. So when we go to harvest these, obviously, you know, scissors or a knife, a good sharp knife, you could bundle these into bundles and hang them to dry. If you do that indoors, I'd make sure you had a pan or something underneath it to catch these as they begin to dry because they'll release themselves. Um, I also have some friends who will take little mesh, mesh sashes and attach them over the tops of the seed head while they're still attached to the plant and let them fully dry while attached to the plant. And then at that point, they'll come out and cut them. And then you take them inside, give them a good shake and your sachet has all the seeds in it. All right, Celeste, here's our Q&A segment. You ready? Yes. These yes. are great questions. Yes. All right, so let's start with the very first viewer email. I have found this growing in my yard. I am pretty sure it is a weed. I've pulled it out and have gotten poked by the thorns and my skin itches after. Can you help me identify this? Thank you. This is Cherie in South Haven, Mississippi. So Celeste, can we help her with the yes, identification there? I think we can. Oh, I think we can. So this is, what you say, wild black blackberry possibly? Mm -hmm. I think so. Mm-hmm. Think I'm so. thinking that's that's what we're looking at there. Yeah, so what I looked at first was pretty much the leaves. It has the pinnate venation, mm -hmm. right? So that lets me know that it's in the bramble family. So then it has thorns. Yes, and I know this yeah. all too well because we, <laughs> uh, my family recently went and picked wild blackberries. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. So I can tell you with confidence that that picture was a blackberry. It's a blackberry. <laughs> so would you encourage Cherie to keep it? Well, I mean, yes, she could definitely, you know, wild blackberries tend to have much smaller mm -hmm. fruit on them yes, than some of our newer yeah. uh, varieties that we have out there on the market. And also they're very thorny. And so there's newer blackberries that are available that are thornless, thornless. and have yes. bigger berries. Yes. So just depends on which direction she wants to go. I'll, I'll leave that up to her. Okay, we'll leave that to you, mm -hmm. Sheree. But yeah, thornless, bigger fruit. Hmm. Mm -hmm. Sounds good to me. Thank you for the question. <laughs> All right, here's our next viewer email. Last year, I planted zucchini and cucumbers in large containers. This spring, an odd weed began to grow in each pot. I left it alone to see what it would do, and now it's actually pretty. <laughs> Can you tell me what this is? And this is land from Dresden, Ohio. So she let it grow, and now it's pretty. Yes. I, I tell folks all the time, they're wildflowers, right? Yes. Nature wildflowers. So what about that ID? You know what that is? Mm. Hmm. Mullen? Uh-huh. So I think that is. <laughs> and I actually, I see it all the time. I live across from a wooded area, so it kind of grows, you know, in that area. They're pretty, though. They are pretty. Yeah. And, and we kind of yeah. joked about them last yeah. year with, with COVID, and we're calling them the toilet paper plant. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I, I remember you saying that. Yeah, they're soft and fuzzy, yeah. you know, um, and could be used for a multitude of things. <laughs> but, no, yeah, they, they really can grow into an attractive plant yeah. and, and eventually will bloom yeah. if... If you leave them there. Yeah, uh, it's a biennial. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it pretty much blooms in the second year. Yeah, be but beautiful yellow flowers, mm -hmm. I think they are. Oh no, like a big yeah, tall a big, stalk. Yeah, big tall stalk. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it's pretty nice. I like the little fuzzy, you know, the woolly uh, hairs on the leaves, I think are pretty cool. So thank you, Lynn. How about that? She actually thinks they're pretty. Yes. That's pretty good. All right, so here's our next viewer email. A white fungus has sprung up overnight under my chestnut tree. This is the first year I've seen this and the tree is healthy now and heavily in blossom. Is the fungus something that will damage the root system of the tree? If so, is there a treatment? Hmm. This is Jamie. Now, we talked about this a little bit, right? I, I happened upon some pictures a while back and actually saw this. So this is the coral mushroom. Oh, good. I've never seen coral it. Coral mushroom. I've never right? seen it before. It's in the Romaria species of mushrooms, mm -hmm. right? So it can grow on decaying wood. Okay, so yeah. just taking advantage of the situation, mm -hmm. you would see it a lot in understories, wooded areas. Wooded that makes areas. sense. Yeah, that makes, makes sense, sense to me. 
And the reason why coral is because it actually looks like coral reef. Reef, yeah, right. it does. Yeah, it has it like does. the little, you know, spiky crown-like uh, tips on it. So that's why they call mm -hmm. it the coral mushroom. So would that make you think, since she's finding this coming up underneath her tree, could this be an indication that she's got some kind of root issue, maybe a root rot happening potentially? See, I think that's possible. Mm-hmm. You know, because any time I hear, you know, or see mushrooms, I, I think about, you know, living on decaying organic material, mm -hmm. uh, dying wood. So I think that's possible. Yeah. So what I would do, how about a certified arborist to come out and assess the plant health? That would be an excellent uh, idea. Yeah, yeah, because the, the fungus itself isn't causing any sickness to the tree. It's just taking advantage of the right. situation. So that's kind of your visual indicator. I think that would be... Um, good next steps right. for that situation. So it could be, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, but there could be some other things that are going on, you know, with the tree as well. Could it be planted too deep or could it be something else? But yeah, anytime I see mushrooms, that's what I think about. It's the first mm -hmm. thing that comes to my mind. Yeah, and those were really neat, a neat new type of mushroom to yeah. see. So I was glad to see Coral that picture. mushrooms, yeah. The things you happen upon when you're just on the web, right? Mm -hmm. Thank you for that question, Jamie. All right, Celeste, that was fun. It was fun. Thank I always much. love question and answer. Yeah, this is fun. Thank you much, appreciate that. Remember, we love to hear from you. Send us an email or letter. The email address is familyplot at wkno.org and the mailing address is familyplot 7151 Cherry Farms Road, Cordova, Tennessee 38016. Or you can go online to familyplotgarden.com. That's all we have time for today. Thanks for joining us. If you want to find out more about all the shrubs Celeste talked about, go to familyplotgarden.com. We also have information on lots of other plants for your garden. Be sure to join us next week for the Family Plot, Gardening in the Mid-South. Be safe.